Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. We are an inclusive faith community seeking to live out the loving, just, and generous way of Jesus. We are participants in a long tradition that's less concerned with doctrines and dogma that demand total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is precious, that we are made by love in order to love. This community is comprised of and affirms the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So, if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to celebrate, if you are uprooted and have come to belong, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home.
try to tame No matter how you run from change Or you can stay the same No matter how you use the stage No matter if you ravage and rage No matter comfort No matter pain All you can stay the same And I hope you come and see me After all the years Cause I don't know where we're going Hi friends, I have a few things to tell you and your response to almost everything I'm gonna tell you can happen at crosspoint.org slash events. So get used to hearing that. Let me show you what I mean. If you are a parent, I know you're hoping on some level that your child grows up to be good with money, maybe performs heart surgeries from the Oval Office. We want our kids to, to turn out great, but we know that beyond achievements, uh, what we really want is for our children to, to be and to grow up in compassion, kindness, awareness of others. How we help them become that is a, the topic of discussion at our next Parenting Lab on May 7th at 7 p.m. If you want to be part of this important discussion, you can go to crosspoint.org slash events and register there. Others of us may be interested to know that Crosspoint is providing a uh, recurring context uh, for connecting with other people around the experience of loss. We're calling this context The Gathering. Um, this is where people will provide and receive support together uh, and talk about living life with grief in it. The Gathering is a twice a month uh, meeting and uh, the, it's an in-person meeting. And the next one is actually tomorrow, Monday the 29th. Once again, I'll point you to crosspoint.org slash events for you to register and uh, let us know to expect you. Speaking of food, which we weren't, but now we can admit we were thinking about it, so we should, we just might as well speak of it. Uh, Crosspoint's teacher in residence, Jeff Chu, is going to be sharing a reflection on the power of food and its role uh, in forming community at our next community conversation. May 4th at 5 p.m., attendees will bring a dish that has some meaning to them, some based on some tradition, some memory that's attached to the, to the meal or uh, a special recipe for your family. There needs to be enough of it uh, for at least 10 people. Uh, registration for this one is required, so go to crosspoint.org slash events to not only tell us that you're coming, but also to tell us what uh, dish you're planning to bring. 
Uh, this is going to be an amazing event. Excited about that. Uh, now, another upcoming event, a, a .org slash event, is Story Night on June 25th. We're headed back to the Fortnite Brewery in Cary for a night of uh, storytelling, true personal stories told around a theme, and the theme this time is imposters. Imposters are uh, those who knowingly misrepresent themselves or, or uh, some product or person that turned out not to be as advertised uh, to us. But sometimes it's a feeling that we have about a role we're expected to play despite feeling, often secretly, completely unqualified. So it's going to be a great night of stories. This time we are putting together our lineup of storytellers by collecting pitches. So if, if you if you have a story that you think fits the theme of imposters in some way, go to crosspoint.org slash events and pitch your story to Story Night. You won't be telling the whole story there. There's a max of 250 words. Um, just give us an overview of what happened, how it affected you, and then we'll go through the pitches, pick the best five or six that, you know, the best fit for the theme. And then we will work with the storytellers like we always do to help the stories take shape uh, in the weeks before. And then June 25th, we'll have a blast listening to our storytellers tell stories at Story Night. Uh, so get your pitches in by June 4th and let me know if you have questions. I'm happy to help you find your story and, and your courage. And finally, this is a slightly different place on our website. Uh, I want to inform or remind those of you looking to um, help sustain what we get to do together at Crosspoint. Not only all the stuff you'll find at slash events, but all the other lives that we get to impact throughout the week uh, with more than easy answers or, or just thoughts and prayers that don't have any action behind them. But with the ongoing work of love, tangible acts of kindness and healing and justice, advocacy, growing in our awareness of ourselves and others, making the way of Christ really mean something that, to those whose lives we get to touch. If, if, if you want to financially sustain what we all do and are together, go to crosspoint.org slash contribute. And uh, there you'll find a handful of ways to do exactly that. Uh, you can even text CrossPoint NC to 77977 and set up contributions right there from your phone. All right, so there's a lot going on. None of us are obligated to do all of it, but I am honored to get to do what we can do together. Peace. Hi. So I know there are millions who would probably disagree with me, but I have to let you know that I've never understood the appeal of NASCAR. I've been to a race, I've watched it on TV, but the repetitiveness of it has always been unappealing to me. But when my oldest daughter was in the sixth grade, I chaperoned her field trip to the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Now, typically after I've agreed to chaperone, I find myself questioning my life choices. And so at first I was skeptical. Again, not only am I not into NASCAR, I was skeptical that a few hundred active sixth graders with really tortoise short attention spans could be entertained for multiple hours at a big circle track. So I'll give away the plot now and let you know that my assumptions, as they so often are, were wrong. The Speedway field trip organizer people were ready. They were 100% prepared for everything that those middle schoolers threw at them. The kids got divided into smaller groups because smart, and then they spent the day participating in all sorts of activities that were not only incredibly fun, but sneakily taught them science. They learned about friction and velocity and why the cars don't fall off the banked track. They learned how weight impacts speed. They drove remote con controlled cars, which I don't actually know what that taught them, but the kids loved it and it filled 30 minutes. But by far the coolest part of the field trip at least for this grown-up chaperone, was that at the very end, we got to experience the science in action when they put all of us in vans, just regular 15 passenger vans, not racing ones, and drove us around the NASCAR track at an incredibly fast speed. It was awesome. So I recently asked my now 10th grade daughter if she remembered that trip, and she wholeheartedly did. Not only did I underestimate the field trip and its educators and organizers, 
I could say it changed me because now anytime I stumble across NASCAR on my TV, I find myself pausing for a few minutes longer than I normally would have and remembering all that stuff I learned as a grown up on a middle school field trip. So even though it still might just look like a bunch of cars driving in a circle to me, I am reminded that there's so much more going on. And really, I think the bottom line is that adults should take more field trips. I guess that I could also say that NASCAR also now reminds me of how often I repeat the cycle of assumption because I allow my mind to determine what I think before I've even had time to think about it. I mean this, I am always sure that I have correctly interpreted a person, situation, or conversation. And so in less than a breath, I have formed my conclusions and I always feel like they're pretty solid, but more often than not, my first impressions, my jumps to judgment are not correct, or at least they're not the whole story. There's almost always much more going on. I feel a bit better knowing that I'm not alone in my tendency to judge. Princeton researchers have discovered that within one to seven seconds after ingesting information, mental, physical, emotional, humans make long lasting judgments. In fact, when we see another human, our snap judgments are even quicker. In about one tenth of a second, we determine what we think about a person, including their character and their trustworthiness. This is barely before we've even had time to see them. Changing our first impressions takes much longer. To change a first impression of another human being, we need to interact with them about eight additional times. Uh, it's probably not gonna happen for that cashier I saw today, or that mom with the tantrum kid, or the teenager in the hoodie, or those people at the protest. I likely won't see any of them again, but I've already determined what I believe to be true about them. And as we've already established, my assumptions tend to be spot on. So in a roundabout way, NASCAR has taught me the importance of pause. Dang you NASCAR in your life lessons. But pausing before we judge or act or speak isn't the only thing to know about pause. I'm also reminded of my addiction to busyness and the next best thing. There's always something to do, somewhere to go, a platform to scroll, a chore, a friend to meet, a kid to transport, a meeting to attend, this move it or lose it feeling. My focus is so often on the horizon and not on the landscape. Maybe you can relate. We aren't really a culture that values pause. Americans work an average of about seven weeks more per year than many other developed countries. And while so many of our citizens are underemployed, meaning they're not able to find work that offers them a living wage or hours enough to pay the bills, at least a third of us are overemployed, meaning we work more than we should. This doesn't mean that we're working harder or more productively, just more. In fact, research shows that worker satisfaction and happiness, this includes work-life balance, is more important to production than the number of hours we work. Happy workers are 13% more productive than unhappy ones. <clears throat> and you might already know that the USA ranks about 23rd out of 30 for the happiest countries in the world. And although American values, our highest values seem to be production, we aren't so great at knowing how to go about doing that. NBC News published an article right before the recent solar eclipse, and its headline was, Solar Eclipse Will Cost America Almost $700 Million in Lost Productivity. How dare the universe. The tagline was, U.S. employers will see at least $694 million in missing output while workers gaze at the nearly two and a half minute eclipse on Monday. This says a lot about where our values lie. Heaven forbid we spend two minutes on collective awe. And just a little bit more discouraging news before we move on. We also can't seem to prioritize the things that we say are important to us or that should be. The United States is only one of only eight 
countries in the world that does not guarantee paid maternity leave. It doesn't require any paternity leave. Production trumps our care for our young. Care for our born is apparently not a part of the pro-life or family values. All of these things lead me to believe that our priorities might be just a little bit skewed. And all this to say, there is an external pressure and an internal compulsion to always be producing, to always be doing something or planning to do something. Social media tells us every second of every day what our friends have done, what they are doing, or what they're about to do. And they look so good doing it. So there's not much incentive to not break the cycle. Movement feels like accomplishment. Pausing can feel a lot like failure, or at least something we should feel guilty about or make excuses for. I think though that not pausing ends up costing us a lot more. When we push against the tendency to rush to judgment or speech or action, when we make margin for pause and notice, when we make pause a habit, we become participants in our own lives. We can quite literally change how we view others and the world. So you might already know there's numerous proverbs that admonish the reader to pause and not respond too quickly. If you act too quickly, you might make a mistake. Proverbs 21, five, haste leads to poverty. Proverbs 29, 20, do you see someone who speaks in haste? There's more for hope for a fool than for them, which is similar to what we're told in James, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Even the great Sir Saint Ferris of Bueller knew that slowing down was important. He gave us this little nugget. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. So if pause is so important, why is it so difficult? Although there are many places we could go in the Bible to find examples of pause, there's one character in particular that's drawn my attention this time. Mary, the mother of Jesus, had plenty of situations in her life when jumping to conclusions would have made a lot more sense. And when moving from the past to the future and completely avoiding the present would have made a lot more sense. Teenage pregnancy, poverty, womanhood, motherhood, wifedom, living under empire, injustices, the abuse and murder of her son, not to mention the regular difficulties of simply just living in the first century. We could go on. There's plenty in the small amount of material we have to justify her lack of pause, but it seems like she might have been pretty good at it. In the book or the Gospel of Luke that tells us the story of Jesus, right after Jesus was born, there's a story of shepherds, these blue collar workers who lived and worked among the animals, and they were close to, if not at, the bottom of the social ladder. I'm sure they were used to snap judgments being made about them. Yet this was the group who were visited by a chorus of singing angels in the sky, and they were told not to be afraid and to go find a baby and worship it. So they did, without asking what repeating the story of night visitors from the sky might do to their already low reputations. They left their sheep, they went to find a baby and his parents, and then they shared with Mary, a brand new mother, all that had happened and why they were there. I imagine that group of men made quite a ruckus. I also imagine that Mary was probably like most first time mothers, a little overwhelmed, sleep deprived, smelling of spit up in need of a bath, realizing she had no idea what she was doing, but at the same time blown away by the whole idea of new human life. I know that if I were her, I would have put the sign out that said, don't ring the bell, the baby's sleeping, and firmly explained to those guys that they would need to come back later. Or at the very least reminded them that what they were saying was a little crazy. Really, they were talking about a baby 
It barely knew how to eat. She had just changed his diaper. He wouldn't be doing any messiahing anytime soon. Who did those guys think they were anyway? Then, when Jesus was 12 years old, Joseph and Mary took him to an annual festival in Jerusalem. When they left to go home, Mary thought Jesus was with Joseph, Joseph thought Jesus was with Mary, and then everybody realized Jesus wasn't with anyone, so they had to go back to the city in a panic and search for him for three days. And they eventually found Jesus in the temple, showing off to all the teachers. Then their little tween, Jesus, had the audacity to ask them why they were upset. The text also says that Jesus then went back to his parents and was obedient. But think for a moment, that's a lot for a parent to take in. A missing child, alone for three days in a big city, frantic searching, only to find him at what was basically church school, with the teachers who informing her how impressed they were by her gangly, probably awkward, maybe acne 12-year-old son. Why hadn't they asked where his mom was? How does one even begin to process that? I believe my response would have been a mixture of tears of relief and an impulse to wring his neck. But in both of these passages, the shepherds at the makeshift cradle and the tween at the temple, the text tells us that Mary's response wasn't moving on and wasn't jumping to conclusions. Instead, we're told both times that Mary treasured all of these things and pondered them in her heart. So these words treasure and ponder, they have this connotation of preserving, like you would a jam or a jelly. Preserving it, capturing it so that you can come back to it later, you can reflect on it, you can savor it. Regardless of what Mary really thought about the shepherds, their wild stories, their sleep interrupting selves, regardless of how angry and afraid she might have been when she found Jesus at the temple and discovered he was a prodigy, Mary chose to pause, to ponder, to cherish. I imagine this is something she had to do a lot as she watched her son grow into an adult travel the countryside as she heard rumors of people wanting to harm and kill him. I wonder if she was able to pause before she took his face in her hands and articulate to him how proud, how terrified she was for him. I wonder how much she had to pause before she didn't tell him all the things she wanted to say. There is benefit to ourselves, to others, maybe even to the world, and learning the art of pause. Not only does pause help keep us from rush judgments or misplaced words, it can help simply slow us down. When our focus is always what's on next, what's on what's next, we can rush from the past to the future and completely bypass the present without participating in it at all. Pause gives us the margin to be present or to step back. The practice of pause helps us to really notice and digest where we are and what is right in front of us. It gives us margin, not only to be, but also to gather information before we rush to judgment. I wanna acknowledge for a second that having the margin of pause can be considered a privilege. I can't honestly suggest that a mother working three jobs to make ends meet or a person experiencing abuse or in the throes of injustice should take time to pause because risk of harm in doing so could be permanent. But perhaps understanding that pause is a privilege might be a wake up call for those of us who have it and might help us fight more vigorously to create a society where others have more margin to do the same. Fighting for living wages, paid leave, affordable childcare, we could go on. My prayer for all of you who do not feel that you have time for pause is that you might find small moments of margin even in the most unexpected places. So you might notice after all of this that we're in a bit of a bind. Pause is a bit countercultural. We live in a world where movement and production and quick and next are encouraged, but where pause is needed and even necessary. The art of pausing or waiting 
of purposefully slowing ourselves is actually considered a spiritual discipline. It falls within the family of mindfulness. And it's a discipline because it takes practice, not because it's punishing. Pausing, waiting, slowing is associated with patience because some level of patience is required in order to slow down our natural desire to go. Maybe pausing, stopping is anti our most basic fight or flight instinct, something we could dig into. But the word patience itself comes from the Latin verb patior, which means to suffer. Forcing ourselves to pause causes us some level of discomfort. And honestly, who wants to do that? It's much easier to receive information, to make a determination about it and to move on or just keep moving forward regardless of what we're missing. However, as we've mentioned already, learning to pause is good for us. The verb to wait is actually considered an active verb. So pausing, waiting doesn't necessarily mean the absence of. On the contrary, when we pause, we might be actively tuning out distractions or actively engaging our senses to become more attuned to our world around us and our place in it. Pause can quite literally change our relationships and our view of the world. So in regard to pausing before speaking or passing judgment, something happens to us when we pause. When we determined we will not be forced into a judgment or into the next thing, but we instead will slow down and digest what we're experiencing. I mean, stopping to interpret, to reinterpret, to translate what might be underneath the surface. Pausing long enough to think through what might be the right time to do or say the next thing. And also learning to be present. How then do we discipline ourselves to pause? So although I don't typically, I wanna offer a few suggestions of how we might incorporate pause into our lives. And these are by no means exhaustive. So take them, leave them, modify them, add your own. We've talked about two really types of related pausing, both asking us to slow down and step fully into our present and also to pause before passing judgment. First, how do we discipline ourselves to pause before making judgments? One way is by asking, is there more going on? Resist the urge to make up our minds about a situation or a person without proper evidence. Does a article or a post seem not quite right? Dig in a little bit deeper. We might ask in questions like, why is a person responding in this particular way? Is there more I don't know about their circumstance or their history? What is it that I don't understand? Are there systems at play that I don't understand? What's really going on here? And why am I upset by their response? We can begin to practice deep listening and observation of others and of ourselves. Practice digging in a little deeper. Um, do we find ourselves responding to a person in a certain way because of what we assume about them? We can dig a little deeper. What are other sides to the story? Second, we can pause before we respond. And this goes for in-person conversations, texts, social media, not to sound like that adult chaperone at the NASCAR track, but not too long ago, there were multiple opportunities for me to stop myself before I said or posted something I would regret. My phone was connected to the wall of our kitchen and my mom was either right there or she could pick up the other line and listen in. I also had ample time to pause before I posted because in order to share a picture, I had to take them without seeing them first, deliver them to be developed by a stranger and then go back and pick them up all before I had to actually officially decide what I was gonna do with them. To share something, I had to either call, write a note, often delivered by a friend or see someone face to face. All of these had built in pauses that we no longer have. We can instantly share an opinion, a photo, a thought, disgust, things we will regret and cannot ever truly take back. Pause is especially important here as we learn to live in instant social media world. A few things to think about before responding or posting to a conversation or something online. Stop, breathe, and ask yourself, is what you're about to post or say beneficial and necessary? Is it harmful or potentially harmful? 
Does it represent the kind of person you are trying to be? And if any of things are clear, maybe we should pause just a little bit longer. Third, how do we keep from moving from the past to the future without being in the present? First, it's practicing slowing down, not rushing our moments, utilizing ideas and feelings like nourish and savor and notice. Even if it's just for a few breaths, taking intentional moments to pause and engage all of our senses. We can ask the questions, what do I wanna remember and what can I be grateful for in this particular moment? Here's just a few suggestions for practices that actually help us physically slow down so that we can mentally slow down. Drive in the slow lane, turn off the radio, Take time to chew your food and taste each bite. Stay at the table longer than it takes to eat your meal. Notice the color of a person's eyes when you're talking to them. Try to put a buffer of time between your meetings. Take a walk without your phone. Stand in the longer line at the store and notice the things and people around you as you wait. Do something boring that you've been avoiding. Say, I love you. So to close, I simply want to leave us with the question, where and how do we need to practice pause? And I want to close us with a blessing. Blessed are we who thought we were self-made by the doing, by the accolades, by the accomplishments, and by the gold stars. We measured our worth by how tired we were every morning, how many special events we missed because of work, and how many times we answered, how are you with busy? We thought this is the good life. Blessed are we who pause. Pause before we say that thing or make that declaration with our minds or with our mouths. Blessed are we who slow down who take time to notice the beauty of our present and where we are and how that feels in our minds and our hearts and our bodies right this very moment. Blessed are we who discover rest and new life and renewal when we step off the treadmill or at least turn it down. We who remember that the world keeps spinning without us and thank God for that. Blessed are we who remember that we are loved, loved, loved. Not for how we judge or what we do, but for who we are. Amen. If you would like to know more or get connected to Crosspoint, go to crosspoint.org. If you're in need of care or assistance, go to crosspoint.org care. And welcome home.